what? This is Sarah Jones with Jason Aisley on the Politicus Pod for Politicus USA. And Amy, we are going to be talking about the debate from the point of view of a woman, that's me, and a man, that's you. So, let's, you start off. I feel like that's appropriate at all, given what's happened with the debate. And I feel like this should be all about you. Uh, women, women are powering this. A woman is leading this movement. Uh, I feel like this would be a great time for men to be supportive, sit down, shut up, and okay. follow lead. Do you think that she won over any men? Last night. She was already performing better with men than expected, and she was performing at Joe Biden's level of 2020 with white men. Nice. Yeah. Oh. Coming in. So there was already a higher baseline of support, and I think some of that white dudes for Harris and some of the white men you see in rally around, that's had an impact. And the idea, the notion that started with black men for Harris, that men needed to be supportive of this time. As I know it's resonated for me to be less of a know-it-all, as it's hard not to do as a man, <laughs> uh, and, and let others lead and be there to have your back to make sure this sexist, misogynistic bullshit that happened to Hillary Clinton doesn't happen to Kamala Harris or any of the other women running around the country. Because this isn't just about Kamala. Right. No, it's about Emil Grace Hour. That's what I wrote about. And I, I think she is a leader, not just running for president, but she's showing women how to embrace that power that you deserve to be at the table. And you don't have to apologize to anyone. And I, I think that one of the big differences that stood out for me was Hillary Clinton oh. had so much that she had to battle in terms of just the baggage from the country, the, the sexism that, that was baked in, and the expectations, which Kamala Harris also had to deal with some of that, but but the culture had dealt with some of it already in terms of Donald Trump's presidency, the, the Women's March, and the Me Too movement, which kind of raised some awareness of the issues that women face, so that people, or at least people with good hearts people with good intentions are at least trying to be better and come to the table and see a lot of men you know open to learning and they care they want to they want to be better partners they want to be better business people uh, and that and that's really encouraging to see so i think she is sending this message to people and interestingly about your point about men white men i saw a comment from a previous trump voter um on Yvonne's health gate about how he wasn't, you know, he he's anti-Trump. So let's, you know, that's it's not some great movement, but that he wasn't feeling great. He doesn't like the the woke, hard left stuff, as as he put it. But he really, after he listened to her last night, really thought that she made the case for a lot of issues that he cares about. And he brought up her point about the generals and the national security people under Trump who said he can't be trusted. He can't be back in office again. And I really thought we saw that at the at the convention, but so many people don't watch conventions. So in this debate, she did reach to people who did not see any of that and weren't aware of who she was. Yeah, and debate audiences primarily, I don't know, this one's probably going to be a lot different. Debate audiences normally are made up of people who are already committed voters. There's very few, even the media exaggerates them, there's very few swing voters that are really sitting down and watching the debate front to back, whole 90 minutes. Those people tend to pick up on uh, things that go viral on cable, brought online video clips, perceptions. They will, that's why it's so important that I write about perceptions all the time in debates, because those perceptions are what creates the late night comedy sketches. They're what create the Saturday, Saturday Night Live sketches. Those perceptions are what swing voters and people that aren't really tuned into politics see. Everything that I laid out in uh, the video I did the, the day of the debate that was talking about what she needed to do and how she could achieve it, she did every single one of those things. 
and yeah, I mean, she was nervous when she first started, but when about seven to eight minutes in, I thought she hit her stride. And what's interesting is I've seen like, I've seen some media critique uh, on the right of her saying, you know, if, if there was no substance and uh, she didn't get into her policies, and I'm wondering how anyone can repeat these claims when you look who she's running against. Right, you're running against Donald Trump. He changes his policies uh, for the audience that's listening. Basically, I mean, we saw him do that. We saw him do that on abortion last night yep. during the debate. Back and forth, he's almost arguing with his own self, and he couldn't figure out where to land because he didn't realize he couldn't figure out who is watching. Some of my base is watching, but some of these people are people I need to make the case to. So we just kept going back and forth. You know, he had three different positions on abortion last night. Three. Thought he had two for sure, but I guess he's come up with another one. So there's two I can name. Well, don't even all night. <laughs> but I do want to ask you. So let's let's talk for a second because the other thing I've heard today, and you're gonna, I want to get your feedback about this. A lot of media are trying to downplay mm-hmm. the Taylor Swift endorsement. They say um, celebrity endorsements don't mean anything, and I think that's usually true because there isn't this action. This call to action and the people don't have the kind of sway that Taylor Swift has, but she's this global brand. And so we already saw by 11 o'clock this morning, uh, the General Services Administration spokesperson told NPR that by 11 o'clock, they had 300,000, uh, 306,422 visitors to vote.gov from Taylor Swift's URL that she shared on Instagram. Now that's 11 o'clock. So she Made that endorsement, what, 10, 30, 11 o'clock last night? Yeah, be 10, 30, 11. So, 12 hours overnight in two. You know, it's like, that's overnight. I would imagine that number is going to grow during the day. Today probably grew quite a bit. Uh, that seems like a lot of people to be signing up to register to vote. It's a lot of people, and there's an exponential factor involved. Because if, this, if, if her fans go to get their friends or family members also registered to vote it, it kind of it, there's a there's a mushroom effect and it just keeps kind of building outward so maybe three hundred six thousand people visited but if each of those people or even a tenth of those people get somebody else to register to vote that number goes up a lot more i think it matters all it matters a great deal because of and let's be honest, who her audience is. Right. Her audience isn't old white cable news viewers. Her audience is women. They're, they're um, Gen Zs. It's a lot of people, a lot of young women turning 18, 18 to 24. The women who have autonomy over their body. That is an, an age where, you know, unfortunately, women are targeted for rape and for 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 violent offenses. This, this is just a really dangerous age for women. And they need to have this autonomy. So I'm really glad that she's sending them to go register to vote. And, you know, she urged, I thought most of was great. I mean, everybody's kind of like pointed out how well she laid that out she didn't tell people who to support. She told them to, you know, go do your research. This is what I think is important. Um, now, I want to talk a little bit about how, why Trump started talking about people eating cats and dogs last night. Because I actually think, and a lot of people, well, this is going to be the joke. This is going to be the takeaway from this debate uh, that she, you know, handled herself like a leader and uh, he did not. Uh, but she also showed her foreign policy chops. She she showed herself as presidential material, but, which is already kind of evident because she's vice president right now. But we haven't got, we don't, as the public, has not gotten to see her in that role. Uh, so, the whole Trump has this thing where whoever speaks to him last, that's the person that's in his head, and that's who he believes. I personally think that is right there bad news and kind of disqualifying for somebody who's going to be president. But because of that trait, he we saw him get off his airplane before this debate, and Laura Loomer came out with him. 
right? To lure lunars, this conspiracy. Of course, then you incites, I would say, acts of terrorism. And she has been banned from every platform, but X, you know, Elon brought her back to Twitter. Um, so this pipeline that the, Donald Trump re- ended up repeating this lie um, about cats and dogs, about people. Uh, where where did this lie? It started from Dab, and then it moved on. Like it was all of a social media, 4chan, Reddit, the Federalist, it was the big screen area. Yeah. Thought it was JD Vance because he's that's where he got it. Then. Uh, was it Jim Jordan? Yeah. So they all started, all the far right people started repeating this. Next thing you know, Donald Trump is in a debate talking about people eating cats and dogs. Yeah. This is how this happened. And that is the judgment. While it's, you know, we can all sit here and talk about, oh, you know, what a fool he made of himself. And he did. But I think there's this other layer to this, which is that he has no judgment. And let's not forget, because this is 9 11, that. When he was running in 2015, he told journalists that there were all these people celebrating, thousands of people celebrating in the United States on 9-11, on the, on the day that it happened. And they asked him, like, nobody has seen, nobody knows what you're talking about. And he said, oh, yes, I saw it on television, which is exactly what he said about uh, this topic. Was it the Canton Dogs that he saw on television? Um, it's his favorite go-to. It was like, I saw this on television. And and PolitiFact was like, we searched everywhere. We we came up with nothing. There's nothing. And Donald Trump's response was, well, I saw it on TV. This is like, so this is the guy that is going to, he wants to come back into the White House and have his finger over the nuclear button. And he believes Laura Loomer and any other fool who talks to him. Yeah, I mean, it's it's the same thing we've been dealing with for eight years on that phone. But one thing popped into my head is you said watching TV. Yeah, it's not on TV. When when TV is on, and to be honest, it's really not on around us a lot. But if it's on and I'm doing something else, how much attention am I actually paying to the television? Not much. You know, if, if I'm in front of my computer and I'm sitting here and I'm looking at one of your brilliant newsletters, like the one today, by the way, which everyone should read, which is now been marked for you. You can all go read today's brilliant newsletter, which we'll put a link to in the post so that everyone can go read it. I'm not really paying attention to whatever's on the screen. So he said he saw it on TV. This is a man who doesn't really pay attention to much of anything at any given time. What did he see? Did he see a commercial with the husband? That's a good point. <laughs> we don't, we know, that's the other thing. And what about this 9-11 thing? Nobody was saying that. Where did you see this on TV? And they did this big search and it, it, it literally had not been on television. So he just makes this stuff up. And I think he, he thinks saw it on TV is like the get out of jail free card, which he might need, by the way, people, if he loses this election. If he thinks that, that just gets him out of everything and it's proof that it was on TV, it's proof. So this reminds me of Homer Simpson saying, TV never lies. Like, that's, if Homer Simpson wants to be your president, if Homer Simpson was a malevolent rapist. That's, that's what we're looking at here. Back to your next I'm make, track. I'm going to make a few points about, about Harris's, but some of my favorite quotes, and, and probably everyone's already heard it, but why not hear it again? You know, she said, this is someone who's openly said he would terminate, I quote, terminate the Constitution of the United States. Uh, another one was, she turned on him. I mean, she took this man to town. I think I started off the newsletter saying that she bent him over her knee. Yeah. Yeah, it was just, it was incredible. So one of the other points that she made was that uh, she, she talked, he was trying to say, you know, Putin wouldn't have, wouldn't invade if I was president, and she was like, you know, if Donald Trump was president, Putin would be sitting uh, in Kiev right now, and because Putin's agenda is, is not a, is 
is not just about Ukraine. Understand why European allies and our NATO allies are so thankful that you are not president and that we understand the importance of the greatest military alliance the world has ever known, which is NATO. I thought that was this moment where you did bring in those, you know, if there's any undecided, but independent voters and even Republicans, Republicans listening who aren't, you know, really impressed with Trump and are, and want rubbish structure sort of maybe make this other choice. Now, we know there's not a lot of movement with Trump's. Support. And remember, 20 to 30 percent of his support is deemed soft support within the Republican Party. And I think that they're not looking to peel away all 20 or 30 percent of those people. They're looking to peel away one percent. Maybe two percent. Turn out the Democrats, turn out young people, and shave off, keep his, you know, shave off this one percent, yeah. whatever you can pick up. One percent in a place like Michigan or Pennsylvania is the difference between winning and losing sometimes. He did not deal well with her, uh, not just her prosecutorial stance, but, and she did have some zingers on that front that were really enjoyable, but she kept setting him up one time after the other with, you know, falling into these traps, these really basic traps. It wasn't like she was doing some kind of deep, uh, you know, deep state strategy. She just, it was obvious stuff, like stuff about his rallies being small. I mean, and then he started making stuff up. Every time she did that, he would lose his mind and start sounding like a lunatic. And that's how he got himself into trouble. Every, all the right wingers were complaining about the cats and dogs thing. But how did we get there? She started him on crowd songs. And he thought the cats and dogs thing was his big immigration. And he was going to use that to really scare voters. Because everybody loves their cats and dogs. Which, by the way, Trump doesn't have any pets. He doesn't like animals. Which is a clear sign that you should never trust anybody that doesn't like animals. Not that they've had a bad experience with it. Lots of people have bad experiences with dogs. They're afraid of dogs. That's normal. That's understandable. And as dog owners, we know to be respectful of those people. But people who just don't like them, I don't trust them. They just had a bad experience, but just because you don't like animals, like he doesn't have any pets. Yeah, there's, there's something wrong with that. And, a bird has have. And then for him to turn around and think that he can make pet owners fearful and he can paint himself as the protector of pets. Which is why the right wing, if you're not online terminally, God bless you, I wish I had oh. But one of the things that Trump supporters are doing online is all these AI images of Trump like rescuing animals and running with geese. Trump with cats. And Trump with cats. And Trump, now they're doing Elon with Taylor Swift after his creepy comment. Uh, and it's like, and I keep asking them, why do you ever ask yourselves why you need to generate AI to show your candidate doing anything humane and, you know, anything you so endure? Yeah. And, and they, you know, they don't seem bothered by it at all. Or maybe they're all bots. It's hard to say. But uh, every time she answered a policy question, and I have seen criticism, but she didn't answer these questions. Yeah, but then. Uh, I think indeed she did get away with not. They wanted to stick her with what they see as Biden's unpopularity, which, you know, they say that polls back that up. And I think there is some truth to that. But any incumbent presidency sort of deals with that, too, because you're the one in charge. So I don't know how how much that was going to stick on him with with her base i mean i don't i just think that's kind of ignorant but i've heard them say that a lot today that they thought that this stuff was going to stick to her i had bachelor's degree is in public policy and i will tell you no one cares no one cares to think what they did for our politics no one watching that debate didn't care what they cared about electoral politics is about what, how the booger feels about their own lives, their own situation, and what they believe a candidate who they hopefully think can relate to them will do to help improve their lives and situation. Well, I said to the BBC, a kind of vibe election. 
and you brought this up last night when we were talking, and you said she kept saying about her tax cut for well, kids. For her, 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 the things she would physically do to put more money in your pocket to make your life better. So these people that are that are saying um, she what she didn't get into the specific. The other point that I want to make about that, I think this is really critical point for the media. If you want any election ever to be about policy or in any age of TV and now, you know, short little viral clips, that's just not going to happen. But if you actually wanted that, if you want to say with a straight face that that's what you think it's about and you think people should answer those questions, then you should pull both candidates to the same standard. We didn't get any policy from Donald Trump. Remember the health care question? When he literally was going on and on about taking away Obamacare, Obamacare's the worst thing ever, he said. Uh, when in fact, as somebody who had to use Obamacare and, you know, in terms of what it means in the marketplace, but that's not the full picture of what Obamacare is. It's a law uh, that protects consumers from, from the greed of insurance companies. And they, it does that by protecting your... Uh, pre-existing conditions it does that by protecting pregnancy and multiple other issues so he goes on this rant about how horrible this man who who is wealthy and has never needed insurance that he couldn't afford ever in his life uh, going he doesn't need insurance he can pay for his medical care right i mean he doesn't need he doesn't need anything he doesn't even know what he's talking about and that was it just really uh was a little offensive then there, he's asked, well, what, what are your, what is your health care policy? And he doesn't have one. He literally is like, oh, I don't, you know, what did he say? I'm coming up with something or I'm working on I it. have concepts. Concepts, yes. I have concepts. That's going to stick with me forever. It's, it, I couldn't get the words out because I'm exhausted from being up all night. And then right now my dog is bothering me. He does this every podcast. He wants to get right near. <laughs> he wants to be on the podcast. He wants to talk to you guys. Uh, but that's important issues to discuss. It's on that moment where he, it's like you, you were already president and you still, you didn't come up with a healthcare alternative then. Nine years. You had nine years and didn't come up with this. Come on. He's gotten to the consent. Conceptual the page of nine years. that Kamala Harris was, you know, had no substance. Uh, talk about projection. I want to read really quickly because I think this says so much. Trump's worst comment, in my opinion. A lot of towns don't want to talk about it because they're so embarrassed by it. In Springfield, they're eating the dogs, the people that come in. They're eating the cats. They're eating They're eating the pets of the people that live there. And that's what's happening in our country. And it's a shame. As far as rallies are concerned, as far as the reason they go is they like what I say. David Muir. I just want to clarify here, you bring up Springfield, Ohio, and ABC News did reach out to the city manager there, and he told us there have been no credible reports of specific claims of pets being harmed, injured, abused by individuals within the immigrant community, Trump. Well, I've seen people on television, beer. Well, let me just say this, Trump. The people on television say my dog was gay and then used food, so maybe he said that, and maybe there's good things to say. Maybe that's a good thing to say for a city manager, beer. I'm not taking this from television. I'm taking it from the city manager, Trump. But these people on television say their dog was eaten by people that went there. Mirror. Again, the city, the Springfield city manager says there's no evidence of that. And that only got stopped because they muted his microphone and moved on. We've seen him in the past go on for 10 or 15 minutes. This is what makes running for president that... Republicans and much of the media are holding up like a legitimate candidate. That man, whoever's brain that is, that I, that I, when, I, when you read it, I'm, I think probably when a woman reads that, it sounds pretty ding batty, you know? And that's kind of an interesting point, too, right? If someone else said this, but if Joe Biden said this stuff, it would be called the media would be foaming at the mouth with pitchforks. But because it's it's Trump, it's you know they just act like this is normal. This is not normal. Yeah, they they've desensitized themselves to him. I wanted to ask you because you keep avoiding this because I don't know why. But you have done so much great writing 
sent the debate, both on the website, pathetic.com, and in the newsletter, The Daily, I wanted to ask you to put it all together. As, as a stupid man who's not a woman who doesn't understand a lot here, things put it together in a way that even I can understand what Kamala Harris's debate performance, what her stature means, maybe give it some context, what Taylor Swift's endorsement means, what everybody coming together as far as women across all sorts of demographics and lifestyles and walks of life. What are we seeing here? I think it's a couple of different things. And thank you for the compliment. I'm exhausted, so I'm not. Um, I have COVID, everybody, so I'm um, working at a deficit here because I was up all night on the debate as I'm, I'm, I think I'm eight days in from COVID. Uh, Take care of yourselves, everyone. I felt for me, what I saw was finally, finally someone stood up to this bully, this man that's been bullying vulnerable people in this country since he first you know, descended that cursed escalator in 2015. Finally, someone, no man, by the way, no other man or woman, managed to do this in any debate with him. She did what no one else has managed to do, and there are a lot of reasons for that, and it's not solely due to specific talents as a politician, some of it due to her personality, uh, some of it events that have occurred, like now he's a convicted felon, that makes a big difference. Nonetheless, it was extraordinarily healing to see him held accountable. Like she had very, a lot of moments where she brought up various things that he's done that, you know, about his convicted felon, you know, his all of the lawsuits that he's right now dealing with. And we have been gaslit about all this stuff. We have been gaslit about this for nine years. We all heard him, we all heard that Access Hollywood tape. We knew who he was. And I think a lot of women, uh, I know myself, I have unfortunately had experiences with men like Donald Trump in my life. And so from those experiences, you learn to recognize that kind of man and you learn to deal with them. I could tell that she, like she likes to tell us she knows his type and she does and she knows how to deal with him. But for all of us women who, who don't have the power to deal with him for nine years, we've been, you know, watching him take our rights away. We've been watching him show pay attempt for women and he's done it to journal women journalists. He's done it to women across the board. He treated Hillary Clinton. You know, he stalked her at that debate. He was he treated her just it was horrible to watch. And we know who this man is. And finally, this powerful woman stood up to him. She turned everything around. And at the end of that debate, he was the one who was afraid. This predator who raped a woman was found liable or or sexual assault at least one time and we know there are many more I think it's 26 credible accusations all of those women and then there's all the women that never came forward and the girls uh, you know the, the dressing rooms that he walked in on all of those women and those girls have been traumatized by this predator and for those of us who have unfortunately had that experience you can feel that from him and feel the pleasure that he gets from re-traumatizing women. And so that's, he's been in our, he's been in our political world, in our spaces, on our TVs constantly. And finally, a woman stood up to him in the political world and had the last word. She, she literally did not have the last word last night, but really... For all intents and purposes, she had the last word because she won that debate. He looked like a fool and she 
showed the world who he was. Did you think he was afraid at the end of the debate? I have my own fate, and I'm not the man. I'm afraid the minute she crossed the stage when he was cowering over there by his lectern to shake his hand, she, she, you know, she went right at him. And I think from that moment, he was off his his footing. He could not come back to that place where he's dominating and he's looming and he's being a thug. He, he never, he tried to come back to that many, many times using the old playbook. But she knows his game. And it did not work. And instead, she started triggering him. Who's the snowflake now? You know? Donald Trump is. And as far as the other question he asked, which I think I addressed, I don't remember which piece it was, but, and maybe the Taylor Swift piece, but a little, a little bit of what, a little bit of what makes me feel really positive as a woman is the Taylor Swift, uh, endorsement she as we all know is a white woman there has been such a a failure on the part of white women to stand up for black women to include them in in fights for justices i I can't see see you guys i should not be talking anymore fights for justice i might be donald trump's new advisor if i keep this up Uh, you got a long way to go many more covid infections that would require god help me Uh, it, it felt really good to see Taylor Swift, the club princess, uh, endorse Kamala Harris. And to see this, there is this coalition that's coming together. I think there's a call coming up next week or the week after that, which is rural voters with black women for Kamala. I mean... This is the kind of unity that we need in this country if we're going to come back together and and be the powerful country and trying to live up to our ideals that we, we will never achieve but should always be aspiring to. And we have been divided by this man. I've been writing about that since the Obama era, so it did feel really good for me also to hear her bring that up to she when she responded to the race question. She started talking about that Donald Trump brings up race to divide this country and people are tired of it. I have been talking about race as used to divide people since President Obama. When, you know, that was obviously the what Republicans use. And Donald Trump, he was the original birther. So it all, uh, it felt full circle to have this coalition is coming together to say we are not going to believe we're not going to fall for this stuff. We're not going to let you destroy this country and our respect for one another, our humanity. And while I know not everyone is going to come together, and there are a lot of people that have been radicalized by Donald Trump, enough of us seem to be coming together to make this a real stand and to uh, hopefully win this election. I mean, I know it's going to be a super close election, but my faith in humanity, the the day that he, you know, when he won that election, I lost faith in my neighbors. I lost faith in in so many people in this country. I could not wrap my head around, how could you, how could you elect a man who was on tape admitting to serially sexually assaulting women? Is that what you guys think of us as, you know, to think of women and I know I wrote about that then, and it, and it and it just stayed with me. This real loss of my hope and my the way that I see people, because I tend to see the best in people. I don't have the kind of cynicism that is required usually in this job, uh, and I try to avoid people that are gonna or that's gonna rub off on me just because I've it's not me. I don't enjoy that. Uh, but Donald Trump brought that out, and he. This, Kamala Harris, Tim Walls, bring, they do bring the joy. I've seen a lot of journalists and, and pundits say joy isn't enough uh, to win an election, and it isn't, but it sure is heck beats what Donald Trump is offering. What can they do with them? That's a unique circumstance. We've had a 
is fun at a funding class and say, I think joy is enough. I think the turning the page, the joy, the breath of fresh air, there's this, this nation's history politically is littered with change elections just because people were tired and they wanted a new direction and they wanted to feel good again. I mean, George W. Bush, no, he didn't have the country pretty good shape except for one medium recession, but he lost because he was the 12th year of Republican rule and he was Reagan's vice president. People wanted to change. And remember, the Clinton campaign was optimism about the future. Remember, Don't Stop by Fleetwood Mac was their campaign theme song. Obama, hope and change. After eight years of Bush and wars and negativity and dark clouds, they... Okay, well, you know who says... It was somebody at the Wall Street Journal... They're yeah. really impressive, but then a lot of people started echoing it. I'm just saying it started yeah. with somebody who clearly has this agenda and, that, yeah. you know, joy doesn't matter. It's basically yeah. under like yeah. a cry for help to me um, because we have seen her, her rally looking like these Taylor Swift concerts. Yeah. Um, it thought it'd be really intimidating for them. Um, and they're kind of back where they were. Uh, they they were really mad about all the celebrities endorsing Obama. Yeah. Remember that? Um, yeah. They got really mad and sort of like, celebrities don't matter. And then they run out to get them. Now they have their own little coalition of like D-list celebrities that they've run out. <laughs> they this kid Rock and Crazy John yeah. Void. Yeah. Oh my God. Right. Kevin Sorbo and Scott Mayo. And, uh, yes. And ah. Clint Eastford talking to the chair. Yeah. And that's, so that's this. I totally agree with you that, uh, I mean, Joy without action obviously isn't gonna win an election, but does it again, we're talking about this kind of visceral reaction people have. And I actually saw a book on Carl Rogue talking about how she won this debate and people who have made up their minds yet are gonna have this visceral reaction to her that's positive, you know, because of the way she conducted herself. And that goes back to the joy thing. And it goes back to it's a joy. There's there's you gotta have confidence you underneath that. You've got to make people think you can handle the job but uh, when you're really because trump won in 2016 and do you really need to have comfort be by now do you really need to have you know i mean i think that's been disproved unless you have the russians you don't really you just need to have some confidence rush trying to put story there and again after eight years of obama people wanted to change cut it and that's how the very narrow margin of less than 100,000 people in three states voted for Donald Trump. And they were radicalized. But, you know, so my point is, when Joe Biden exited the stage, Donald Trump became the eight years of, of the same. The nine years of the same, because he's never bust. He's never bust. That's what I'm saying. My God. When he was talking last night, he, you know, he, he talked a lot more with them, right? He kept talking over her, and, and they were allowing it. Uh, that would be my one criticism of that in the election denialism, that they, you know, tried to fact-check him on, but he continued on. I, I thought they did a great job, a really good job. It's a very difficult job uh, to be in that environment uh, and try to control this guy. Nobody else has managed to do it, so let's give these people their flowers. They did a great job. You know, no one else has managed. They, some things fell through the cracks, but still, it, it was a it was a a very good job, all things considered. Looking at who who we're talking about here, yeah, I um, I think that they're in a really good position as far as the moderators. The moderators, to me, what they did was they fact check the right things at the right time. They didn't try to fact check everything, and then they didn't let everything go. But when something was completely and absolutely utterly false to the point of being dangerous or harmful to other people, and to me, and like the, the common thread in their three fact checks was these are all things that can be harmful, right? You're going to harm people with this lie and something. So we got to stop that. And their and their tone, the way they conducted to themselves, it was just spot on. And I, I now remember what I was going to say. He, he, talked so much that right before they took 
the, the intermission, I started screaming at him, shut up, just shut up. Because, you know, he's just they're they're annoying. I mean, the way he goes, he whines and he whines and he whines and he complained and he's lying and he's just like, God, it just make it stop. I mean, and then I realized, like, yeah, I'm really annoyed. But this is what he did before that the voters reacted to in the debate with Biden, even though the media didn't say it. But the voters did. They were really turned off by him. And he did it again. But this time he did it against somebody who had a very strong debate performance. And so he lost and lost in this way. I, he probably lost more women. Yeah. I mean, honestly, as a woman watching that, uh, I wanted him to shut up so badly. I, I thought about turning the whole thing off. I think you're going to see potentially historic gender gaps in the next I don't know how much the overall numbers are going to shift because debates historically really haven't mattered. But I think you're going to see some gender within those numbers. You're going to see some really big gender gap. And just because he's going to alienate, I think, every woman that could potentially vote against. Look in times is the oh yeah, well, he, they're going out of their way. Look at JD Vance, what he did today to Taylor Swift. Like they are going out of their way to make sure everybody knows we're the weirdos, we're the creeps, we're the people you run from when you were in college at a frat party and you saw us in across the room. You ran, left the party because you knew you can't trust our your drink around these guys. Gotta go. I do want to bring up one other issue about gender and. You remember when the media attacked Hillary Clinton as being overprepared? Yeah. I saw someone attacked uh, Kamala as being overprepared. Kamala Harris as being overprepared. One of the journalists last night. Uh, this same media giving Trump a pass, right, on his, quote, concept of a health plan. Is Are, are we ever going to see any kind of... Give yeah, him too much. I don't... He didn't say he has a concept. He has several concepts. He hasn't even picked a concept yet. That's right. It was plural concepts of a plan. <laughs> I can't really talk because I said justices, so I feel like maybe I can't criticize his concepts of a plan. But a concept nine years going on is is not okay. He's going to be dead. Jump the healthcare plan at this rate. But why is Hillary overprepared and Kamala Harris is over and Trump nine years on can escape by without even doing the homework? Like he's not even saying my dog ate it. He literally doesn't think he even has to bring in a sheet of dog didn't eat it because there is no there is because the image the because they were drinking his dog. But and buddy. Yeah, I uh, we could talk about RFK because he was on Fox helping Trump out by telling him that he basically had a terrible debate and he expects Trump phone numbers to go down next week after. But so that's the kind of endorser Donald Trump gets. That's what Donald Trump deserves. Because let's not forget that he was telling everybody he last night that uh, you know he's a great uh, he would make a great president because Viktor Orban, the authoritarian dictator of Hungary, likes him. You know, one of these days before this election, we're going to sit down and we're going to tap into that beautiful brain for any years. Oh, and call Trump is out. I think he called him. Yeah, but he never calls his own brain brain beautiful. He <laughs> calls himself beautiful. Well, it's too close. Well, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to tap into that vast well of intelligence that you possess. The phrase Trump's never used. Really Ask doing. me for and we're going to do a podcast about Victor Orban and authoritarians. And the right we can. That's what I was going to have. I've been writing about that since. Seven years now? Yeah. Yeah. And who knew that it was going to. We were actually going to have an election where this was the issue, in my opinion. Uh, I mean, there are many issues abortion, et cetera, freedom. But. Do we want to keep your country? It's kind of a big one, and because if you don't get to keep your country, none of these other issues are even 
going to matter. So. And the last thing, I have the privilege of being with, talking to, and working with someone who is deeply, deeply intelligent and, and has, that has more policy knowledge than almost anyone I know. And every time I read something you write or listen to you talk, I learn something. And I know I'm not the only one. It's very sweet. Like, you you have made a lot of progress as a man. And I just this truth. But that's very, I mean, you don't have to say these things. It's very nice. And I appreciate it. But it, we've been working together since, is it 2010? And, yeah. And uh, there have been some swallow, right? Where it was difficult for you oh. to, a couple of struggles. Difficult for you to always bust and remember you. No, but I think that's true. Like we don't teach men to have uh, what they need to do to work with a woman. I mean, that's just, yeah, let's yeah. just put it that way. So, uh, yeah, I would love to have that podcast. And thank you for your kind comments. I appreciate them right. as. No, that's enough. You're making me blush. I don't want. Oh, I was just going to say, like, when there wouldn't be, if I'm useful or insightful to anyone at all in my writing, there wouldn't, we are, we are two halves of the same, we're two halves of the same circle. And there wouldn't be any quality in me without what you bring to the table or the daily and everything else. Like the last Rosado. So, I'm um, deaf. Yeah. Well, it's a good situation. So, I want people to always realize that, like, when they when they see two of us on the byline for the newsletter, there really are two of us here. Right. Huh. What do they like, think? They're like, like, there's it's not just like one of us, one thing, one of us, another. Mm. I think if if the if the community works for the the daily and the daily is a great community and we owe our subscribers so much for their helping build this community with their comments with their interactions with us we appreciate them so much. Honestly, these comments have got me through the last you know six months. Our our commenters are are. The best on the internet. I have not seen better comments. We don't have to. Mm-hmm. We're not in here like trying to get rid of nasty trolls. Maybe we just got lucky so far. Uh, but the comments have really helped me. Uh, they keep me inspired, and you know, it it matters to know that what you're doing because um, it, it does. Sometimes this does come at quite a cost, and it and it matters to know that too. The people that you're doing it for and that they care so they and they're getting yeah, all yeah, we, we we will give up a whole lot to do oh that's the fact that, well i had a point where i'm going right. there where do you, you go ahead uh, i'll be cool i just wanted to say we have it's deeply important to us sarah and i have a personal goal we really wanted to get to a thousand page subscribers we are less than, we are 900 and some away. So anyone who's listening to this, if you, we would love it if you would come join our community. Yeah. Or we're 100 and something. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was up, I was up till four in the morning, so I don't, yeah, right. I can't do math. But we are, yeah. Um, yeah, we're 100 and something away. Yeah. So please. Less than 100. So please consider joining us. Join this great community full of wonderful people. People who I feel like I know. Yeah, because we see them every day. They come in. And um, you guys mean a lot to us. And I was hoping that by Dr. Kamala Harris's debate, using this podcast to give appreciation to all women for their leadership, including my partner here, City X Committee. And, you know, using this moment to say, now's our time to shut up, boys. <laughs> But you're still talking. And d- these are part of yeah, I came down from it's like they're sweet and oh, I'm bad one. I hope you out. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna wrap this up and uh so yes. help us with the last one hundred, you guys, if you can. Uh, make sure you subscribe. Our newsletter's free, but if you can help to support it, 
Um, that would be wonderful. And wonderful. we do want to do the shout out to our paid subscribers because they make it possible for us to keep a lot of essential information free for those who can't afford it. Thank you guys so much. Hang in there. We have two months to go till this election.